Great. Well, this afternoon we have David Weaver of Vintage Cash Cow. Uh, David, um, welcome, welcome on board. If you'd be kind enough to um, introduce yourself to uh, the audience, let them know what you do and how you're helping people right now. For sure. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so Vintage Cash Cow, we're the easy way to sell old stuff. That's what we call ourselves. We are a way for people to pack up a box of old, old and interesting antiques and collectible kind of items. So anything with a bit of age to it, we'll happily take a look at it. So anything from jewellery, costume jewellery, watches, pens, coins, silver cutlery. God, I should know them all. I've said them enough times. But anything like that, we allow people to pack them up in a box book a free home collection or drop to a post office and then our team of experts give them a cash offer um, where we differ from a lot of other companies is that there's not barcodes on the stuff we want to buy you know it's not all by weight either so we have to really take a look in detail and we make our customers a simple offer for the entire box and with that they can either accept or decline so it's a same day bank transfer or a check in the post or some customers choose to have all their items sent back for free. If they feel they could sell it more for else, more elsewhere, that's fine. Um, some customers, they do like our offer, but there's one or two things a bit sentimental in there for them. We, we often ask, well, we ask our customers on the call, is there anything sentimental? And what you sometimes find is it might be something like, you know, the, what, what about the old thrifty bit? It was from my father and it's been turned into a chain pendant. And we say, well, before we go any further, you can have that back for free. And we'll keep the offer the same. So we 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 love to, we talk to our customers on the offer process, and um, it's a chance to work out with them if there's any particular things they held sentimental value to, and then we send that back, and then we uh, keep the offer the same. So yeah, it's a easy way to cash in, basically. Wonderful. So so it sounds like obviously you made the process of um, transfer of the items quite easy, but you do have the personal call with somebody so it's not just a, an offline yeah. thing you're actually speaking to the clients exactly that and it wasn't always like that so when we first started uh, myself and an antique dealer antique trader it, there was no customer service team and we didn't you know we were working out as we went along but at the start I called every customer when they first joined and then Anthony called the customer with their offer and then you're getting busier we're getting more boxes and we're well Anthony can't call every customer and and you find that, well, let's call the higher value ones. And if it's, if it is a lower offer, then let's try just sending an email. And what we found is that some people, it led to more bad reviews because you didn't yeah. have a chance to explain things. People, they send in, again, they send in that old coin that is a hundred years old and they've thought it's worth millions for ages or they've thought it's worth a lot of money anyway, a lot more than, than it actually is. Um, so you need to sometimes explain that. And it really goes a long way. So we, at one point, we shifted over to emailing the offers, customer logs in, accept or decline. And what we found is, yeah, we had a lower accept rate, but more of the people that accepted the offer then went to leave a review to say they weren't too happy with the offer. Right. So when you speak over the phone, you let them know, look, please know you can have all this back for free. You can then have a conversation about that coin. They really, really hold, you know, hold value to sentimental value to you'd give them a chance to have it back and you get to explain more about the stuff so we have customers email and say i've got five gold watches can i send them in well of course you can as part of a larger parcel we'll happily look at the five gold watches and when they arrive they're gold in color you know they're gold plated cocktail watches but some people's expectations were set by the person that gave them the item as well and you can't find that out over an email with a button to click you know you need to have that conversation so yeah we really pride ourselves on the on the personal touch you know with our with our customers typically over 50 but you know over 60 over 70 we've got someone on the database 104 years old they want to have a chat they want to have a conversation and, and we, we, we we always make sure that we uh we, we can give them that personal touch brilliant it's fun it's fantastic i mean what you're doing is I, i'm sure it's very current and you're just thinking about, oh, we're going to talk about how we've had a lot of businesses had to modify what they do. And yeah. what we found is, you know, using technology and, and the processes that, that, that have been enabled a lot by the, the, the outbreak and, and, and the lockdown ha has meant transacting what we do actually more effective and efficient. The personal touch can't be replaced. That communicating with people on a, on a human to human basis is still absolutely vital. So it sounds like you've got the best of both worlds. Uh, it always is. And, and especially on, 
on the front end as well. By front end, I mean when someone first joins our service. So we have the personal touch on the end with the offer, but when someone registers for their free selling pack, the first thing they then see is your packs, your packs on its way to you. It's, it's ready to be sent. If you'd like a, a phone call now, you can book in a free welcome call. So every person that registers, we don't know whether they've got yeah you know, one coin on its own to send or whether they've got three grand's worth of watches and jewelry, but we offer every single person a chance to have a conversation with one of our customer service team at the front. We have about 40% of people book, book that phone call in, which is fantastic. And what our guys here, what they love about it is, what our customer service team love is that they're used to having a manager down their neck telling them to you know, get your call times down. But if, if someone's having a conversation, it's going on for 10, 15 minutes. You know, it's, that person's got questions about things they hold valuable to them that they're trying to decide whether they should let them go and send them to someone they've never heard of before in return for a, a, a cash offer that may or may not please them. So that upfront phone conversation is a great way for people just to, it's, it's kind of ask me anything, come at us with all your questions, and then our guys flick through the brochure and ask them about the product as well. So yeah, it's uh, the personal services. It's just, okay. it's paramount to what we do. Brilliant, love it, absolutely love it. So um, obviously one of the purposes of the, of the interview today was just over the last sort of eight, nine months, COVID hit. How, how did the COVID outbreak and the lockdown affect you and your business? Well, yeah, it was very, very hard um, you know, for us at the start. So I think if we go into February around, that was it late March, I think the lockdown first started. I think there was news of that. I mean, for, we went over to Amsterdam, I think it was in February or at the beginning of March to meet with our investors, lay out plans for the year. You know, if our business has been up and down since we've started, you know, we've not been without our kind of near death experiences as a company. Um, but we get into this year, advertising channels in January and February have never worked better. Everything's going to plan. We meet the investors, you know, here's our six pillars for growth for the rest of this year. And if we achieve this, here's what we're going to do in 2021. I think within two weeks, that plan out the window. Um, we, we quickly, so the first impact we had was the click through rates on our ads, uh, especially on Facebook, less people were clicking our ads. So everyone, and I actually mean everyone I've spoke to about our service earlier in the lockdown, were saying everyone's at home, everyone's got more time, everyone needs more money. Surely you guys are doing really well, but with, our, with, with the way the, coronavirus and the impacts the more older people you know a, a lot more than the younger people and that's our the audience we're targeting i think the strong signal we got from our ads was that you know, there's, there's obviously a lot of fear here you know people it's not the top of their agenda to make a bit of extra cash at the minute so clicks on our ads went down that pushed our price our costs per uh, customer to acquire that went up and then within two weeks so let's say second week of April perhaps yeah two weeks after the lockdown that's when the boxes really stopped coming in they really slowed down so if we bought around 2,000 boxes in March I believe we I think we went down to 500 or 600 in April um, charity shops when they closed that's all the charity shop boxes gone that was 350 boxes we were receiving a month and yeah we went down to about five six hundred boxes um, wow. that was April um, 500 boxes in May 600 boxes in June it, it just went down so we had to move fast um, I think one of the lessons we've got as founders in, in the past is when things have gone bad or they're not going quite your way you know we're all doing this for the first time you know so we're always very hopeful and we always think we're going to work things out fast and we've kind of avoided the uncomfortable conversations for perhaps a bit a bit too long so on this occasion with the furlough support scheme it enabled us to quickly take action to ensure we can protect as many jobs as possible I believe we furloughed 25 out of 32 or 33 of our staff at the time. You know, one person customer service, you know, one person um, handling the boxes coming in. Wow. And we, we really had to go skeleton staff, furlough as many people as possible, just to ensure we can you know, keep on handling the boxes that are coming in. Um, and yeah, we, we, it really hurt us hard, but we weren't, we didn't just sit and wait. We were trying things. Uh, we were trying a lot of things. Um, admittedly, the first thing we tried in hindsight, which is fantastic, in hindsight, you know, was a, a poor assumption that could have had a lot more research wrapped around it. And what we decided to do, what I decided to do was to change our user journey so people don't order a free guide and then hunt around their home. 
and, and the free guide they order also has postage labels for the post office. We kind of, quite a fast move. We, we took a you know, real fast action here and it cost us, I believe, because we moved to, when you land on the site, it's straight to booking your, uh, book your home collection. Yeah. We were, well, we, I was under the view that people wouldn't be going to the post office. You know, like the, the, the traffic we do get, let's go straight to home collection. People don't want to leave their homes. They're not allowed to leave their homes. Stick to home collection. Well, what we then realized after two or three weeks of trying different types of ads is that, as what we've seen in the past with similar tests, when people land on our website, they're still deciding as to whether they're going to use us or not at all. So skipping to booking a home collection, we went from like 7% conversion rate on Facebook ads down to under 1%. Didn't work. Um, what do you try after that? You go a bit of both worlds. You say, do you want a home collection or do you want a post office drop off? And you give them a choice. And that was yeah, the next best idea. What happened? People aren't ready to make that choice. Yes. So it then so that maybe four, five, six weeks has passed now. And we're getting to the end of well, the end of June is when let's say we've decided those two tests have failed and we realize lockdown restrictions are being relaxed gradually. And we went back to the old way. We went back to getting that pack in the post. Uh, yeah. We rebranded it a free selling pack instead of a free guide. We took our best performing Facebook ad from January and February, which showed people actually spending the money, what they spent the money on, which is a, yes. it's the outcome after the cash. You know, we've always right. focused on get some cash. Whereas then when we showed people spending the money, that led to much better performance. So we then put that on the website. You know, it's all over the site now. You can see what people actually spent the money on. We changed our form for, from a two-step form to a one-step form. And we redesigned and rewrote all the copy of our post sign up email journey. So all these changes happened. The lockdown restrictions were relaxed. And on 7th of July, flicked back on some Facebook advertising. And we've never looked back, really. Um, we've really? got, we managed to get 24 out of 25 of the staff back from furlough. Um, the one person we were unfortunate not able to bring back, I mean, at the time, especially, it was in our charity department. We had two senior people running the department, but we had to be extra careful at that stage. And the ch we weren't sure how this was going to affect charity for our business as well. So we're unfortunate not to bring back um, yeah, one of the people on our charity team. But we had 24 people come back. Um, our cost per leads have been very acceptable below what we'd previously been targeted for. And the biggest change to our business as a result of all of these things we've done was that before lockdown, before lockdown one, on average, people that sign up to our service in any given week, within 10 weeks, we would have bought a box from about 20% of them. Whereas since all of this has changed and since all of our improvements, within about five weeks, we're buying a box from 30%. Oh, wow. So we can afford to you know, have a higher cost per lead. We can afford to expand our marketing channels. It really opens up a lot of doors for us. It's uh, yeah, so the forced slowdown, you know, gave us a bit of breathing space to try things out. And those, they all kind of, which specific one had the biggest impact? I don't know. There might be a way to work it out, but we're, we're, we're back and bigger than ever now. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, come out, from a, come out from all of that in a really strong position. Fantastic. It's a great example of uh, one of these we say is marketing is ultimately mathematics. It's, it's, you know, there's a creative part to it. Absolutely. We need to try different things, but the market, the market will tell us what's a great ad. We don't need to be super gurus. We try stuff and see what works. And, oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. And take your learnings. Take, it's easy to deploy an advert and quickly get some answers. Yes. So if I want to make a change to our homepage and plaster it with what people spent their money on, I've got to go to my developer. I'm, I'm sure some companies it's yeah. easier than others. And we've got a really fast, competent developer. So it's easy for us, but it's quite a, quite an intense change to go through. How about just sticking your assumption in an advert, seeing what the traction's like, seeing what the engagement's like. And if it proves to, to work, if you get some strong signals for it, then go through the, you know, the uh, more expensive, you know, both time and resource wise uh, change and perhaps try and incorporate it into a, a website feature, you know, yes. and, and that we definitely, definitely think that helps, that that's helped things, you know, taking our best ad, applying that concept to the website and yeah, we're looking forward to doing more of that. Brilliant. It's, it's interesting the whole, that procedural thing. I think we found ourselves, it, it needs that um, 
I always find with, with regard to sort of coming to a website or coming to a landing page, people need to be caught in the way they've, where they've come from. So they need that continuity of message. So the idea yeah. that, as you say, they came on immediately was, you know, let me send you the pack or what well, it, 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 I haven't decided yet. So it's, it's, it's starting to help them, right? What will help you make the decision? Um, yeah, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think what happened um, at that, for us at that early stage is that those fundamentals around marketing that people need to be warmed up and they need to you create awareness and then get to some desire, a bit, bit of information, and then get them to take action. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those things that when everything, when all, everything just comes, you know, starts blowing apart and you're thinking, well, what these advertising campaigns, they're completely failing boxes are dropping it's almost like at that moment in time which is a big lesson it's almost like marketing fundamentals kind of went out the window and yes. we allowed ourselves myself especially to feel quite blinkered and then thought just on just thinking about one point of a customer customer's decision to use us or not and my one point I focused on was most people won't want to leave the house so they'll book a collection and it's like I forgot everything you know <laughs> about the fact that people need to be warming up warmed up and understand more about how the service works yeah and, and the other thing you, you talked about is there's a guy called andy bounds who talks he's, he's, he's quite an influencer on on sales specifically and he talks about people don't want what we do they want the afters so people don't necessarily want to sell their stuff they want the afters of what they're going to do with the money um yes. people, people no one's ever actually woke up in the morning and said they want a business coach what they actually want is more profit more happiness more time in the exactly business. Exactly. So focusing on the after, not the actual process or the or the thing they're going to do. It's the true after as well. So if you're a business coach, you uh, you could say if you're a business coach and you're pitching people who uh, you know perhaps become on board as a client and you, you know, get a, a retainer kind of deal from them. It's like well, in your advertising, it's uh, it's not necessarily that they're you know you know just the business is failing, but really painting I think painting a picture of the true outcome and the true outcome is perhaps a more stable relationship with, you know, with, with friends and family as well. And, and your staff happier too. It's like the true outcome is that good feeling you feel inside when you've done, when you've re really got the actual outcome. So just better re results isn't one thing. And that's the, what happened with us. It's uh, which came about in a, we were shooting a pilot for a TV show in January. Uh, we had the producer of Dickinson's real deal and he was set that the, the team that are shooting one of our team on customer service and he kind of just nudged me and he just said do, do you do your guys ever ask people what they plan to spend the money on and i said you know four years after we started i was like no i never tried that um it, it's always been about you know send this stuff you know this pile of stuff you know here's this is an example of what you could send and here's an example of how much money you get for it and, but the true outcome is, of course, a layer further, which you, you kind of kick yourself. You've never done it sooner, right? But yeah, it's um, really people care about their true outcome right down to that final moment, the moment where, because that a bit of extra money to treat your friend to a meal, you know, like the picture of someone at a meal with their friend, you can instantly relate to and you picture yourself at that table. So when you show people, here's some stuff, which actually isn't their stuff, so they're not related to that really, especially yeah. if we show silver plate notes and coins and actually they've got some gold, you know, but when you say, send your, you know, here's what you could do with the, um, the money you get, all of a sudden, they're not really thinking instantly there, specifics about what they might or might not have. It's like, well, actually, I'd like to go treat myself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, now have I got some things that you guys sell? So you're kind of looking at it a bit differently there. Brilliant. Yeah, so it, it really is, you know, the, the, the key for me is always thinking in terms of what the other person's going to achieve. We use the term, what's in it for me? It's We often market and sell what we do rather than what people get. And that they, once you, what, what, you know, getting that message and understanding just totally transforms how we communicate and, and how we deal people through the process, as, as you're right yeah. to say. So, goodness, we've had some wins and some, some ups and downs. What would, what would you say the biggest learning you've had through this process? The biggest learning, I think the biggest learning through this process, I think, I think we've, we were implementing or following our biggest learning from previous ish problems in the past. So we have, as I said, we've been, we've been, you know, at a point in the past where we've lost our ability to sell through, 
through eBay for a period of time, which really hit us hard. We never expected it. It came out of nowhere. It caused problems. It led to redundancies. And it, that taught us to you know, stay positive, be resilient, be creative as well. And, you know, even through the way we managed to get our account back online really took some, you know, creativity on trying to get through to a human on the phone system, you know, with uh, some great crazy story around that with Anthony when he managed to finally speak to someone in concierge. But yeah, we, we kind of come into this having only last year been through a, a real tough period. So we, we stayed resilient. We stayed positive. We, we met as a team even more regularly to try and work out what we can and can't do. We, we took much more decisive action around the uncomfortable things like well, this time it's furloughing. Furloughing is a lot more, it's uncomfortable, but it's a lot as uncomfortable as redundancies, of course. Um, so I felt like we were, we were able to handle this, all this downtime through all these kind of these challenges because of the big challenges we had in the past. So I feel like we handled it much better because of what's happened in the past, but it's just staying resilient and just understanding that this is just part of the journey, you know, and once us, um, it's, it's in everything. If you see your business as an upward spiral, maybe I could draw it on the board if I've got a pen that works. <laughs> oh, so actually, funny enough, it sounds like it's set up. It's already there. I drew this upward spiral during lockdown, if you can see it at all. Uh, yeah, 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 I can see it. Yeah, well, funny enough. I and my desk was actually the other side of the room, but I was I drew that. Oh, my camera's just come out. Am I still on the audio? You're still on audio, yeah. Oh, camera will be back on in a second. Cool, yeah. there we are. I drew that upward spiral. It's from reading a book by Ray Dalio called Principles. And it's one of these points around evolution is always optim you're always optimizing for the whole. And I think our business, all these dents and punches and all these things we've actually had to take on the chin. It all contributes this upward spiral where it's up, 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 up. And then it's like, oh, shit, what's happened? You know, and then it's back round again and regroup. And this upward spiral yeah. just kind of stayed with me. And it's just, it's one thing condensing a lesson and learning down into a quote or phrase or set of actions, but just an upward spiral, you know, yeah. as, a, as a reminder, has just been really, really good to look at on my wall from time to time. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's great. And Ray Dalio's book, Principles, I'd say is worth checking out for that. Yeah. You just... You learn to embrace the hard shit. <laughs> you know, you really, really do. I think I think one of the one of the realities is is that if, if business, if, if every business just went like that, then everyone would be doing it. And, and it'd be so, boring. It'd be so it, well, boring. It'd certainly be boring. You, and, you wouldn't, someone told you wouldn't. me a long time ago, actually, that the, the job of a business owner is to solve problems. So if you don't like problems, get out of business. It's, exactly. You know, it'd, be, it'd be so boring. And also what you wouldn't have is you wouldn't have those lessons to take away with you into your personal life and all your yeah. future things. Because everyone goes through you know, shit in their personal life all the time. And I know full, I know 100% that no matter what it is that happens to me in the next few months or few years, anything bad with family, I feel I'm so much more better equipped to handle it because yes. of the, you know, the resilience we've been forced to demonstrate if we want to succeed in our business. You know, I've, we've been through real tough times, you know, and uh, that can only help me outside of the business as well. So, you know, the, falling for the ostrich effect and burying your head in the sand when shit hits the fan, you know, it's, um, you know, it might, it might, disappear or someone else might solve it for you but approaching the uncomfortable conversations and handling the tough yeah. understanding that that's your responsibility then and believing that i'm going to benefit from this forever this hard yeah. problem you know there'll be you don't always join the dots in your head when things happen as in like oh this happened in the past and now i'm doing that but if you really believe that the more there's always learnings and lessons on the other side of uncomfortable situations and conversations. Yeah. And once you just believe that, you kind of, you, you just don't avoid them as much. You just don't avoid them as much. Definitely, definitely. And it, it, it's, um, I, I often use the, the founder of my organization, a guy called Brad Sugars, who's a very successful guy. And he told me a long time ago that he is as successful as he is because he's made more, more mistakes than anybody else he knows. And it, it's the comfort to, try things and accept mistakes that's that's helped him progress much more quickly than the fit being fearful of a mistake well that's fearful from a, a business challenge point of view a personal um but you know what other people think of me um, as a result of making a mistake or whatever and and you know the more i i, I speak to people that are that are doing well it is that desire understanding of that spiral as, as you've described that it's okay to have a dip it's okay to have a problem 
um, yeah. learning from it, get rolling with the punches, which I think most of us have had to do so much over the last yeah. nine, nine months, compared to probably the previous several years where, um, you know, things, things were fairly straightforward. In, yeah. In yeah, with a, with a lot of people, it's like, I know, I know people that run agencies, their own agency for 15 years, no longer running. You know, it's like, well, everyone yeah. has their ups and downs, but what is forced, it's forced so many people into having to have, you know, do these, you know, make these tough decisions and go through this, these tough periods and, 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 you know, and really, really keep their belief. You know, I, me and me and Anthony here, we both own a part of my friend's events business. You know, they went from four or five years ago, we helped get that off the ground. You know, that was me and Max going over to Sydney and running the first event. And last year, I think they had 21, 21 events in maybe eight countries. He's got a team of 10 and it's really taken on a world of its own. Well, you know, everyone's furloughed. It's just him, him and his, his girlfriend now able to keep things ticking over, testing live events in the meantime. And, you know, it's, 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 it, I've seen a lot of examples of people showing resilience and really thinking outside the box at, at, the, at the same time as well. And it is great to see. And it's, um, yeah, it's just, it's, I recall last year, the most year we've had issues, you know, problems, right? But I recall, I recall last year when we had issues with the eBay account, you know, you don't want to get out of bed. You know, you don't want to face the music. You really, really don't, you know, and I, I'm glad I had that. I'm glad I was like that at that level because I wouldn't want to be like that at a future far progress level in terms of the business yeah. with even more responsibility. It's like, I probably got away with burying my head in the sand a little bit. Probably, <laughs> I probably wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got away with it this time around. Uh, <laughs> but there was periods, there's always going to be days like that when things are going really bad. But I didn't find that or myself feeling like that at all this year. Um, you know, as tough as it, it, as it as it's been, I found myself and, you know, co-founder Anthony here and, and the other you know, senior management team and the staff, we felt like approaching it honestly, openly, talking about the shit, you know, not hiding it, you know, being real with everyone. You know, we felt like just a different group of people navigating this storm this time round. And again, hopefully there's, there's lessons learned from it as well, I'm sure, but they don't seem as hard, you know, vivid and hard hitting as what happened last year. We really learned it last year, but implemented it this year. That's where we are, we are now. But yeah, we've come out from it great we've hired not only have we got 24 people back from furlough but i think we've hired well we had three people start last week and i believe it, the week before that i'd said we'd had eight yeah we've had 11 people join in the last six weeks oh my goodness so, we've so got how, how many people do you have now including now i think we're on to 48 49 oh my goodness that's doubled so you've doubled since no, we were no, we were on we were on 30, 25, let's get these numbers right. We followed 25 of 32. Oh, sorry, got you. Yeah, yeah. 25 of 32. And then yeah. since then we've hired eleven. Yeah. Which might be twelve. Let's call it eleven. So we're on four. Yep, yeah, we're up there now, mid-40s. And uh, we've got four placements live, which we just got confirmation on Friday about from the government's new kickstart job scheme to put people right. from the age of 16 to 24 out of who are out of work and non-universal credit i believe it's yeah universal credit um give them work you know six month placement um our goal is to find some real gems and, and actually do what a boss of mine at a previous place done back when i was you know 19 20 he, i was working at a claims management company and he got awarded employer of the year and he was helping people at ymca and really finding some great people from there and really giving them chances and having great people join us. So we want to start the placement scheme. We've got four roles. I believe we'll be prepared to take up to eight people for those four roles mm -hmm. as soon as possible. We'd have them tomorrow if they were, if they were there. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, we've now and we've started our waiting list for our .com USA America site, hopefully to launch there at the end of next year. So it's... Uh, a lot's happened. <laughs> a lot's happened off the back of this. Absolutely incredible. Well done. I mean, that's, that's a third, growing by a third in, in what for most of us is a very challenging time. So uh, in, in two months, yeah, as well. So we, yeah, all of those have joined in two months. <laughs> Pretty, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and what, what, if any, did the second lockdown, what impact did that have on you? Zero. Cool. No, not quite. Uh, Right, zero, almost zero, almost zero. Um, <laughs> we haven't furloughed anyone. We've carried on hiring. We yep. have 
had our charity shops, of course, close, um, which meant when the charity shops closed, we moved our outreach for finding new charity partners. We shifted that to Scotland and Wales only. Um, we still have maintained contact with senior decision makers at charities uh, during this period. So while boxes coming in from charity shops has stopped, we have managed to secure Okay, so we've got 1,700 shops registered on our system and on our, to use our service. In our pipeline of organisations who have said we will launch with you, either regional or national, after the second lockdown, through maintaining that contact, they're not following our partnership manager, keeping him here while the shops are closed. We've yep. now secured, if you total all of the shops from those organisations, it's 3,000 new shops. So we might go from seven, yeah. If things go to plan, we'll go from 1,700 shops to 4,700 by the end of Q1 next year, um, which has been great. You know, you've got all you, some top organizations there in terms of size of shops, but a lot of hospices as well joining and getting a more awareness about it as well. So, yeah, that's uh, impact in box wise. Let's see if I can remember these top of my head. We went to around, we bought 2,660 boxes last month. The previous month we bought 2,000, well, 2,660 last month, we bought 2,630 in October. So we only went up by 30 boxes, but we didn't have our usual three to 400 from the charities. Right. That was up from 2,300 a month before, 2,000 a month before that. So we, we've gone from that kind of five, 600 level up to the, you know, Brilliant. 1,700, 2,000, 26. Um, December's expected to drop. We've only got 17 working days to buy in. Um, our goal is to jump up to three and a half thousand in February. Right. Brilliant. So, yeah, it's been uh, exciting. Growth. It's been exciting. You know, we've spent four years trying to grow this business where we've been you know, burning cash and trying to grow fast and have all these lessons. We've been so fortunate to have the founder of, you know, we transfer the founder of Just Eat, founder of So Connect as our core group of close investors. Uh, but even with the help of some of Europe's best entrepreneurs, this business hasn't been without its challenges. Yeah. Uh, so to, to reach you know, a strong break even point six months ago and grow from there, you know, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been an amazing journey. So it's, um, you know, with, uh, during this time, you know, we're still aware of a lot of other companies that have found it difficult. I'm a, I've got you know, a few friends of mine, you know, I've got Antique Dealer, Gold Buyer, a roofing company, and, um, and a CBD oil seller, all been hurt really bad. And just as a, a thing on the side, just trying to help them rank better on local business search as well and provide them a bit of our t marketing team's resource as well, just to kind of help them during this, you know, because it's, I feel like we are one of the few. Yeah. You know, we are one of the, many have survived, of course, many haven't survived, but I just feel like we're one of the few that have actually come out of this bigger than ever and i feel like it's uh we just want to keep our feet on the ground with it and you know be grateful that that's we had a lot of bad luck at the start and bad decision making but if i had made two or three more bad decisions instead of those few good ones that, that mounted up you know we wouldn't perhaps be where we are now so yeah i feel very grateful that we've got not just from it but we've been able to kind of start taking off brilliant brilliant absolutely fantastic and look, you know, we, we through through the lockdown, we and we continue this. We're offering um, up to fifteen bi uh, gifted business uh, growth sessions every week. So if any of the guys you mentioned would benefit from just talking through the business, please let me know. It's, it's totally complimentary. We we like you just want to help the business community. Yep. So that's part of doing these these interviews. Just to, yep. So so please do that. So I, I think the best way to uh, maybe maybe wrap, wrap the interview up is. Um, is asking what the future looks like because I can't wait to see the answer. <laughs> the future, what does the future look like? Uh, the future's bright, the future's vintage, I think I'd call it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think you might, I think that tap, tap, um, strap line might have gone. <laughs> uh, yeah, it may well have gone, but I think we might, yeah, I think that's how, but for us, that's everywhere has got stuff, right? Everywhere has got old yeah. stuff. We are not yeah. accepting anywhere near what we could accept. That's one thing. So we've got, you know, we've got continued growth in the UK with the view that what an eight pound, an eight pound CPL, you know, used to be something we sought, we sought after for us when it comes to Facebook ads with the old conversion rate down to a box. We're, we're now able to, you know, confidently operate around 15, cost, 15 pound cost per lead on Facebook. You right. know, it's like, so 
I don't even, I haven't even attempted to try and put into numbers what that really could mean on, fa on Facebook alone for us. But I, we'll, we're looking to do about five to six million turnover this year. Um, we're starting next year with all of these lessons in place, all of these new strategies and tactics and, and, and growth initiatives ready and working now for us at the start. So we expect in the UK alone, we should be reaching up to down the 15 million turnover next year. Um, we are now researching where and why we'd launch in America and which locations from the cost of postage to where the most of the auction houses are to where we won't, where we, where we'll be able to find the most staff. We're going through that process now as well. We do hope that we can start on some level in America by the end of next year. Um, and we hope to have at least 50% of the 13,000 charity shops in the country using us. I, I believe we should be on over 4,000 by the end of Q1. Um, and we have started selling in China. Uh, one of the few UK based companies launch uh, selling old antiques, vintage items and collectibles in China where there's huge demand. There is a lot of disposable income there. There's a lot of people there and they really want a taste of, you know, taste of Europe and a taste of Britain. So we've had great success with an e-commerce store and we hope to continue selling there and, and grow that side of the business. And what all of that does as well with us selling in more places and being able to make more money from our items is we can pass that on to our customers at the front end when we're buying. But we're also now, we haven't, we're, we're now about to start trying to find partners, charity partners to work with us in a different way, more on a consignment basis. So charities have been hit really hard. They've lost a lot of shops. They've also had to cut the size of their eBay team. So what we're now, we're going through the process now to find our first two or three partners to work with us where based on a set list of types of items we're prepared to sell for a charity is that a charity can send us a load of items in bulk. It won't send us a lorry. Right. We'll, we'll have a fee per listing and yeah. then we will take a, a very fair percentage of the sale price. Now, we are very, very, very efficient and we've got experts in such a wide range of items that we strongly believe that we can be a very cost effective way of charities to be able to scale because they might get more product than ever coming in, but we know firsthand that a lot of them are having to tip this and stuff and, and just get rid of it because they haven't got the space. So we're, it's horrible to think that people are donating items that perhaps don't, don't actually generate money for the charity. And we really think we can help there. So yeah, selling on consignment on behalf of charities and allowing yep. them to scale cost effectively is another. So yeah, what does the future hold for cash cow? There's a lot. Um, if only if I'm right about half of that, then I'll be a very happy guy. Amazing, absolutely wonderful. And well, hopefully, if you'll be kind enough, maybe you can come back in 12 months' time and tell us exactly where you are. And hopefully, we're already well on to launching in the US. That would be amazing. Love to. Perhaps I'll be in uh, in Florida somewhere, or one of the states we plan to launch in. Uh, Florida's got a lot of uh, you know a lot of auction houses and. Uh, perhaps next time in 12 months, yeah, I'll be uh, a phone call from stateside. That'll be Zoom nice. you in from there. That'll be wonderful. Well, David, thank you so much. It's been really brilliant to hear your story and all the positive messages and uh, speak to somebody so passionate and enthusiastic as yourself. Well, thank uh, you. Well, thanks for having me. It's been great. I, well, you're very welcome. I think that's a key part of, of any entrepreneurial um, you know, makeup is that passion and, and, and enthusiasm. So absolutely wish you all the best. Thank I just you want so to just share one share one thing at the yeah. end as well. It's just for anyone who who's watching this, who's got a bit of a success story, but doesn't usually get on the camera at all. Because I don't, I don't really. It's only in the last few weeks where we've, you know, through availability issues, I had to do our first live stream to customers, and then through a part a Telegraph Business Club uh, interview a week ago, you know, we've done a series of interviews there as well. So we're like. We're not, we don't get on camera enough, I feel, myself and the guys here at this company. So anyone who's listening, watching this, who's got a great success story or something to share, you know, I just encourage you just to, you know, have a chat with you guys and just perhaps arrange something and just talk about it. Because uh, I know it's something which not really put off, but for, oh, I don't want to be on camera. We don't, don't want to talk, don't want to share. And it's like, it's now more important than ever to share if you've got some, especially if you've got, if you've got good things to share, then just get it arranged, get on camera, start talking and start sharing. I think people need to do it more. Definitely. Wise words. And now because it's, because it's the mechanism by which we communicate, you know, video, a Zoom, it, it, it's how we communicate with people now. So the more we do, the better. And 
and, and a thank you because yeah, we we you know so we want to get as many positive stories out there to to balance up with the negativity that unfortunately takes place in these what are challenging times for many people. But you know, there's still um, mm. a lot of opportunity if we go out and look for it. Yeah, no, for hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, I um, wish you all the best, and thanks for having me on. It's been fantastic. Thanks so much, David.